So this is the last segment about theory, and this is about yield surfaces and yield criteria. So if you think about a, a tensile test, we take a little bar and we stretch it along its one axis. So we'll call that one, uh, call that one two, um, threes into the page. If we stretch it along its one axis, what we'll get, um, well, defining the stress, the strains aren't defined, we find them out. But if we plot that as a stress-strain curve, stress one, strain one, what we'll have is we'll have an elastic region, which is recoverable. At some point, which we call yielding, um, then we get start to get irreversible plastic deformation. If we unloaded it at this point, we come back down the same uh, elastic line that we originally had. And this is, of course, Young's modulus. Now, ha what happens when you're in a different stress situation, a triaxial stress situation or a shear stress situation, um, can you translate or how can we translate from the tensile test to the real situation when you might have an arbitrary stress state in an arbitrary uh, stress tensor with its six components? Oops. And it's symmetric parts there. How do we get from that to something we can relate to a tensile test? And what we think, imagine is, well, let's go and find the principal axes and rotate to the principal stress state, where we have principal stresses sigma 1, sigma 2, and sigma 3. Now, What's the biggest Mohr's circle I could draw? Come back to Mohr's circle for a moment. Well, um, say sigma 3 is negative. Say sigma 2 is here. And say sigma 1 is there. Now, if I do a Mohr's circle between sigma 1 and sigma 2, I'll get somewhere anywhere in there, say, I don't know, there and there, say, something like that. That stress state be that average uh, plus this amount. Uh, and this one with this shear. If I did one between sigma and sigma th 2 and 3, I'd get that Mohr circle. And if I did one between sigma 1 and sigma 3, that is a rotation about the two, two principal axis, I'd get that Mohr circle. And um, if I, uh, there's a little bit of a, a detail here, but the biggest um, Mohr's circle I can draw is that one. So the biggest shear stress I can draw is that one, which is the radius of that Mohr's circle. So um, there's a little objection, which is what happens if I rotate around sigma 3 and the sigma 1, 2, say? So if I rotate around um, the sigma 3 axis, what I would get is I would get a new stress here and here. So I get um, sigma 1, 1 prime sigma 2 2 prime in my new primed axes here a sigma 1 2 prime and a sigma 1 2 prime sigma 3 naught 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 and the objection goes well but I've, I've moved out here moved out here I've now got a bit of a shear can I do a rotation between those two to which the answer is no if I then do a rotation between sigma 3 and this one what I'm doing this is the new sigma 1 1 prime so I'm doing a rotation sigma 1, 1 prime, 0, 0, sigma 3. So I'm doing a rotation here, and that gives me a smaller circle. So this really is true. The maximum shear stress you can find in the system is the radius of the Mohr circle between the largest and smallest principal stress. And that radius is the difference between, is half the difference between sigma 3 and sigma 1. So the maximum shear you can find is the radius of this Mohr circle, which is a half times the difference between sigma th 1 and sigma 3. Okay, and that's the maximum shear stress we can find anywhere in the system. And we've said previously with dislocations that uh, plasticity is a shear process. It changes the shape of the body, um, but not its volume. And so, uh, and that's something that shear does. So this is, if you ignore crystallography, this is a good criteria for finding yielding, and that's called uh, the Tresca criteria. So Tresca was a person, uh, so it's criterion. 
It's the Trasca criterion. Um, and this is uh, a, a criteria for yielding. Um, and so we say, well, OK, we'll call that our critical yield stress for, for yield to occur. Now think about our tensile test. In our tensile test, we had a stress matrix or a stress tensor of sigma y with zeros everywhere else. So the principal stresses were sigma y naught and naught. So that's equal to, um, so here, the maximum shear stress is equal to sigma y minus naught. So that's our yield stress just there. So the Tresca criteria is that the difference between the two principal stresses divided by two is equal to the yield stress. OK, very nice. Now, there's another way to make a yield criteria, um, which is uh, after von Mises. And this is a, a bit more tricky. I'm just going to write it down. This is based on a stress invariant. And it is that twice the von Mises stress squared is equal to sigma 1 minus sigma 2 squared plus sigma 2 minus sigma 3 squared plus sigma 3 minus sigma 1 squared, where sigma 1, 2, and 3 are the principal stresses. Um, so these are all sigma 1, 2, and 3 are the principal stresses. So we're operating in principal stress space, if you like. So we've reduced the six-dimensional problem to a three-dimensional problem by first finding the principal stresses. OK, so if we think about a tensile test here, again, we've got sigma y, 0, and 0. So in a tensile test situation, you've got twice sigma von Mises squared is equal to sigma y minus naught squared plus naught minus naught squared plus naught minus sigma y squared which is equal to twice sigma y squared. So sigma von Mises is equal to sigma y. So then we can say twice sigma y squared, so sigma y being the yield stress in tension, is equal to sigma 1 minus sigma 2 squared plus sigma 2 minus sigma 3 squared plus sigma 3 minus sigma 1 squared. And that's called the von Mises criteria. OK, so they've been designed the way we've specified them such that, so this is um, simple tension. They've de been de defined such that for a tensile test, they give you the same answer for the yield stress. But let's look at what happens, say, for pure shear. So for pure shear, we've got a stress matrix of uh, naught, tor, tor, naught, 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 naught. And if we rotate, um, sorry, somebody knocking at my door. If we rotate to the find the principal axes, what we'll have is we'll have uh, a Mohr's circle of this. So we'll have plus tor and minus tor. We'll call this the tor at yielding. Uh, well, let's, yeah, let's call this the tor at yielding. So we'll have tor, 0, and minus tor when we order the principal stresses from biggest to smallest, OK? When we order them from sigma 1, 2, 3. Um, really, this is the problem. Really, they should be like that. But then we've reordered them to be tor y, naught, minus tor y, naught, 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 naught. And um, so that's what's happened. Those are our principal stresses. They're tor and minus tor. And when we put them into von Mises, what do we get? We'll get 2 times the yield stress in tension is equal to, um, or the sigma von Mises, if you like, the von Mises. Let's go back to calling it von Mises. Is equal to um, tor minus naught squared minus um, sorry, tor y. Sigma 2 is naught minus minus tor y. Sigma 3 is minus tor y. 
oops, sorry, plus uh, minus tau y minus tau y, sigma 3 is minus tau y and sigma 1 is tau y squared. So we'll have tau y squared, and we'll have 1 there, uh, 1 there, and we'll have 4 there. So then sigma von Mises is equal to tau y times uh, 6 over 2, all square rooted, so that's equal to root 3. So for pure shear, then the von Mises stress is equal to root 3 of tau y. For Tresca, the maximum shear stress in the system is just tau y, fairly obviously. So then we'll have tau max is equal to tau y. Okay. Um, and, uh, oh, no, 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 no. The, I've still got to go to my principal stresses, haven't I? Silly. So they're tau and minus tau y. So if I plug them in there, tau max is equal to a half tau y minus minus tau y, so that's equal to 2 tau y over 2, so tau y. Okay, so here we find a couple of things. One is that for pure shear compared to pure tension, then the yield stress in pure shear is a half that of pure tension. Okay, so it's half the tensile yield stress. So Tresca the yield stress for pure shear is half that for tension. That's our first conclusion. And our second conclusion was that the von Mises um, yield for pure shear um, when we compared it to our sigma y there, is equal to root 3 over 2, which is equal to 0.577. Let me just check that. Um, uh, no. Sorry. Sorry. It's not that. It's 1 over root 3. When you work it out, I've got root 3 here, and I've just got sigma y there. So they relate just by pulling it over, 1 over root 3. And 1 over root 3 is 0.577 times that for pure tension. So those are my two conclusions of this. And so the two yield criteria predict slightly different answers for pure shear. And that's very interesting. So I'll just clear the board, and we'll explore that in a bit more detail. Now, I've got these yield criteria working for the principal stresses. There's three of those. Now I can plot them out um, on, a, on a set of axes. So I could plot them out on a set of axes like this. Get my right hand out. Um, that'd be one, two, and three. And there'll be some envelope within which yielding doesn't happen, and some envelope outside of which it, it can't go because it would have yielded. And the envelope we'll call our yield criteria. It's the locus, if you like, of the yield criteria. Now, it's difficult to draw things in 3D, so let's just think about the example of 2D. So, plot them out in 2D. So let's assume that sigma 2, the middle, middle principal stress, is zero. Okay? And we'll plot out what happens. This one's sigma one, this one's sigma three. 
Now it'll slightly break them being in order from, a set, from biggest to smallest. Now for Tresca, when you're in pure tension, it yields here at sigma y. Okay, fine. Um, Tresca was that the yield stress in pure tension is equal to uh, sigma 1 minus sigma 3. That's biggest and smallest. Big, small. Okay. Now, when we go out and sigma 3 goes up and everything else is zero, we'll also hit yielding at the same point, sigma y. When we go out negative, well, um, the, other, the biggest principal stress is naught, the middle one's naught, and the smallest one is minus sigma 1 in this case. So um, that just means we'll go out the same distance here, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10. So we'll hit sigma y here. And the same is true here. Now, when sigma 1 is equal to sigma 3, what happens? Well, the biggest principal stress is sigma 1, and the lowest principal stress will be this guy, sigma 2. So when sigma 3 is positive but smaller than sigma 1, so we go up here, we'll get uh, a yield surface where, as long as we're in this side, there's no yielding occurring. So this is uh, sigma 1 is biggest, sigma 3 is greater than sigma 2, um, and sigma 2 is equal to 0. Here, as we go along uh, here, here sigma 3 is the biggest, and sigma 1 is smaller but positive. So sigma 1 is greater than sigma 2, which is 0. So here we'll have sigma 3 minus 0 being our yielding criteria, so we'll hit it at this point sigma y. And where these intersect, we'll have uh, a, a coincident point here. So yielding happens outside. Okay. The same is true when we're in the negative negative quadrant. So we'll be out here. Now in this quadrant here, sigma 1 is greater than 0, sigma 2 is equal to 0, and sigma 3 is less than 0. Okay? So the biggest is sigma 1, the smallest is sigma 3. So every megapascal we add on to sigma 3 that's negative here reduces the yield stress for sigma 1. So we get a line like this. Okay? And the same is true up here where sigma 3 is positive and sigma 1 is negative. So that's what the Tresca criteria looks like when plotted in 2D. It looks like this hexagonal lozenge. Now if I take the von Mises criteria, so the von Mises criteria um, is that sigma y is equal to uh, sigma 1 minus sigma 3. Let me just check my halves. Um, so that's the yield stress in pure tension. Sigma 1 minus sigma 2 squared plus sigma 2 minus sigma 3 squared plus sigma 3 minus sigma 1 squared. And for pure tension here, let me just get a red pen. Those two were equal. So pure tension, we must be here. Pure compression because of the squares. It just comes out, so it goes through those. For pure shear, well, then they were equal and opposite, and we said that they were slightly different. They were a number where the von Mises stress was 1 over point, it was 0.577 times as opposed to a half. So it's out here. And for biaxial tension, when they're equal to each other, when they're both positive, well, what happens? So we're going along this line, if we go along the line y equals x here, um, then we'll have sigma y is equal to... Um, sigma 1 squared plus, here we'll have our middle principal stress will be sigma 3, um, so that'll be uh, sigma 1 minus sigma 1 squared when we put it into that first one. Our middle principal stress is sigma 3, um, so that's sigma 1, because they're equal to each other, minus 0 squared, plus 
uh, our lowest principal stress is zero still, um, zero minus sigma one squared. So what I'll have here is zero, I'll have twice sigma one squared. Um, so uh, when I put that in, that comes out as being uh, root two, um, and I need to do a sigma vm, uh, I need to put a two in there, don't I? And then it'll all work out, and a squared. So that'll be here, and the same is true down here. And what von Mises looks like is it looks like an elliptical yield surface. So this is my von Mises. And again, we got that by considering each of these four quadrants. So that's the von Mises criteria plotted in principal stress space. Now, what's happening here? Well, what's happening here is the yield surface is shifted out because we've got a component of uh, hydrostatic stress. And here it's shifted in because we haven't. Uh, we've got a lower hydrostatic stress. And the logic is, is that yielding is caused by hydrostatic stress. So, hydrostatic, uh, sorry, yielding isn't caused by hydrostatic stress. That is, a pressure that is a hydrostatic stress changes the volume of our material. It doesn't change the shape. So it can't cause yielding. Because plasticity is just a change of shape, not a change of volume. It's just the d d material moving around. Um, yielding plasticity is a shape change. So however many dislocations we move around in the material, it's still the same volume. So, and the hydrostatic stress, if you like, um, is increasing here. Um, but here, it's actually decreasing um, compared to this situation. So we need to consider hydrostatic stresses a little bit. Um, so let's go on a little bit of our diversion through the world of hydrostatic stress. So we defined hydrostatic stress as being a third times the trace of the stress tensor um, which was also invariant, so it's a third times the trace of the principal stress tensor as well. Okay? And so we can uh, do something clever if we want to, just to introduce it. We can say that our, our stress tensor is equal to a sigma h times i, the identity tensor, um, plus a deviatoric stress tensor, which we'll call sigma prime. So this is the deviatoric stress tensor. So what I mean by that is if I've got sigma 1, 1, sigma 2, 2, sigma 3, 3, sigma 1, 2, sigma 1, 3, sigma 2, 3, 1, 2, 1, 3, 2, 3, I can call that is equal to um, sigma h, sigma h, sigma h, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, plus something that's, these would be unaffected by that, the shears, And these guys would be sigma 1, 1 minus sigma h um, and sigma 2, 2 minus sigma h and sigma 3, 3 minus sigma h. Now if I add up the trace of this tensor, the trace of the deviatoric stress tensor, what I'll get is I'll get sigma 1, 1 plus sigma 2, 2 plus sigma 3, 3 minus 3 times sigma h, which is equal to uh, a third of the trace, so this is equal to zero, 
So this is the t stress tensor that has no hydrostatic component. So this is the one that causes yielding and causes only shape change. Um, now, this is the one that causes plastic deformation. And uh, one of the things that the von Mises and Tresca criteria do in those subtractions is they net off the hydrostatic stress. So for instance, if I take Tresca sigma y is equal to a half sigma 1 minus sigma 3, uh, I'll just call it tor max. It's not sigma y. Um, it would be sigma y equals sigma 1 minus sigma 3. So that's Tresca. Notice when I do this subtraction, it doesn't matter if I do it with this tensor or this tensor because the sigma h's will drop out. Yeah? So if this is equal to, really supposed to be equal to sigma, I should call these primed. Um, so sigma 1, 1 primed is equal to that. If I do it with sigma 1, 1 prime minus sigma 3, 3 primed, that's equal to a half times sigma 1, 1 minus sigma h um, minus sigma 3, 3 minus sigma h, and the sigma h's will drop away. So it doesn't matter if I do it with the original normal regular stress tensor. Let's call it the regular stress tensor, if we're going to be American about it. Normal stress tensor, um, ordinary stress tensor. Um, and uh, all the Vitoric stress tensor, it'll still work out. And the same is true for von Mises. So I don't need to worry about uh, the difference between Vitoric and hydrostatic stress tensors for the purposes of applying the yield criteria. Um, but it's obvious that they should matter. So coming back from having defined Vitoric stress tensor and had a bit of a think about how it works as applied to the yield criteria, we can go back to that graphical sketch. And in 2D, so sigma 2 was equal to naught, in 2D we had this lozenge. Um, and for von Mises we had this. Now, if I imagine going back to my real 3D set of axes, let's draw it like that. So these are, let's call that one, uh, one, two, and three axes for my principal axes. What I would have is I would have a cylind cylinder, which was the von Mises criteria, going down the one, one, one axis, so the sigma h axis. So if I imagine an axis that comes out of a hydrostatic stress, that is sigma, a pure hydrostatic stress, sigma 1 equals sigma 2 equals sigma 3, then the von Mises criteria is a cylinder wrapped around it. And if I'm inside the cylinder, it doesn't yield, and if I'm outside the cylinder, it does. And the Tresca criteria actually looks like a hexagonal prism um, wrapped around that hydrostatic stress axis. And that's what's drawn in the notes. So if I look, it might be to some um, view natural to look down the hydrostatic stress axis so if I look down the hydrostatic stress axis, then what I would have is my three, one, two, and three axes would then be at 60 degrees to each other on there, so that or 120 degrees, so that's sigma one, that's sigma two, that's sigma three. And looking down that one, 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 if you like, hydrostatic stress axis, then that would be von Mises and Tresca uh, would be um, a, a hexagonal prism. And I've got to think a little bit about it's a hexagonal prism that looks like that. I think, no, that's not right, because um, that's a square. It's a hexagonal prism that's therefore looking something like that. going through a half of each, halfway through each one, if you like. And that's Tresca. I've got to think about the angle a little bit more carefully than I have luxury to now. 
Um, and so when you're looking down that hydrostatic stress axis, then these two yield criteria suddenly turn from being these funny shapes to the regular shape. It's just that we're slicing through, if you like, the base or plane of this cylinder um, and this hexagonal prism. Um, so to a certain, um, this is called the pi plane or the plasticity plane method of projection. So to one view, you might say the way to think about yielding is of a hydrostatic stress uh, direction and then one that's sigma 1 minus sigma 2 and one that's sigma 2 minus sigma 3 or something like that. There'll be three independent possibilities for the principal stresses um, and one of them we could call sigma 8 and then we'd have the other two and we'd say that yielding only concerned stuff going on in this plane and this one just caused volume change and that's the, f the final way to think about yielding. So um, we're at the end of the course. Um, that's the end of, uh, of thinking about elastic strains, is the limit of elasticity when yielding occurs. And so you're set up really now to think about what goes on with biaxial or multiaxial stress states um, and how to then establish whether or not something yields relative to a tensile test, um, how to rotate stresses, how to rotate strains, how to think about isotropic and anisotropic elasticity. And that's really been uh, the subject of this course. So have fun. Cheers.